Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Worship at St. Louis this morning. Uh, we have a special morning this morning because we are going to be blessing quilts from our quilting group that just started. Uh, how long ago did you all start in quilting? A couple months ago? A month ago. A month ago? So look at what they've done already in a month. So we will be blessing the quilts today and that will take place right after the hymn of the day. Uh, and Today we got a busy week, or this week we have a busy week, so I just want to get through the week announcements. If anybody else has any announcements outside of this week, uh, let me know. Tuesday night, the council is going to be meeting with a representative from the Synod to talk about the interim period. Uh, so that's an important meeting for the council and uh, for the Synod. Matt, was there anything more that needed to be said on that? No. Okay. <laughs> Wednesday night is our last night of... Uh, well, it's not our last night of confirmation, but it's the last night uh, that I'll be at confirmation. So we will be having a confirmation, uh, kind of a party. We're, I'm going to pick up some pizzas, and we're going to do games. And this is going to be for everybody from fifth grade uh, to my current class, because uh, the fifth graders come to Sunday confirmation. And then uh, those who are being confirmed uh, Sunday are invited as well. So... Uh, for the whole confirmation crew and for those uh, who are teachers and leaders, I see Scott's here. Um, it's for you, for them as well. Uh, and uh, so I'm looking forward to, to Wednesday, Thursday night. We will have an evening service at 7 p.m. And Sunday will be confirmation Sunday. A week from today will be confirmation Sunday. And there will be a reception put on by the council. So I'm uh, looking forward to, to uh, confirming that young uh, group. Uh, very nice young people, so if you can make it, please do. And then for the reception afterward. Anything else that anybody else wants to bring up? That's what I have to do. Oh, there's bread out there, yes. So if you can get some bread, get some bread. And all the other announcements are in here, so please read, uh, please read uh, the bulletin because I can only remember for the week, so if there's anybody else who wants to give an announcement, please feel free to do so, because pretty soon, you got the announcements, you guys are going to be giving them, so get used to it. Um, so if there are no other announcements, please rise for confession and forgiveness of sins. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sin to God, who is faithful and just, and who has promised to forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess to you that we have sinned against you in God, word, and deed, by what we have done. With joy I proclaim to you that Almighty God, rich in mercy, abundant in love, forgives you all your sin, and grants you newness of life in Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God.
of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Then the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people 
but take the goods for yourself. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord, the God most high, maker of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours, so that you might say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me, Anna, Eshkol, and Mamre. Let them take their share. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Human priests of old offered sacrifice for their own sins and served only until their death. In contrast, Jesus is God's Son, the holy, sinless, resurrected High Priest. Death did not terminate his priestly service, but through his death, he has interceded for our sins. The second reading comes from Hebrews, the seventh chapter. <laughs> Furthermore, the former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. <coughs> Consequently, he is able for all time to save those who approach God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it is fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, blameless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he has no need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins, and then for those of the people. This he did once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests those who are subject to weakness. But the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Word of God, word of life. Thank you, God. Please stand for the gospel of the Not my cell phone, people. It's my office phone. <laughs> All right, if I can get the first picture, Katie. I want to talk a little bit about tall buildings. Have any of you guys been in a tall building before? Are any of you guys afraid of heights? You are, Amelia? You don't like being up there? Okay, okay yeah. Um, the, I guess the tallest building right now um, is uh, it's called the Burj Khalifa. And it is in Dubai, uh, and it is in the United Arab Emirates. Does anyone know where that is? I really, you know, if you would ask me on the map, I mean, I, I know where it is because I looked it up. What's up? You never went there? Well, it is across the Atlantic Ocean in the Middle East. It's in a very tiny country, but it's a very tall building in, uh, in a very small country. In fact, the building itself is over a half a mile tall. Is that pretty tall? 
Yeah, I think I, I don't know, I, I'm not really afraid, I mean, I, I don't like to be on rooftops that much, um, but I, you know, it, I, I skydive, so I'm not terri totally terrified of heights, but I, I don't like to, um, I don't really like to be up the edge of a roof, so I may not like to be on a window in that building. But what's interesting about that building, which is over half a million, I mean, it's, it, it's great for tourists. The whole, the whole city is really geared to tour tourism of the world and business. Uh, but buildings have a place, and you can have a lot of office buildings there, right? You know, you can have people come over for uh, what they call conventions, which is kind of like business parties, you know, they can come over for that. But if you're trying to build, a, you know, a building really high that would go out into outer space, we probably wouldn't be that successful. In the Old Testament, there was a building, uh, it was called the Tower of Babel, and they weren't very successful with that. But I was like thinking of that, we call them skyscrapers. But even if we took the tallest one uh, that is in Dubai, Dubai, that tallest one, if we wanted to get it lined up to the moon, we would probably, uh, and there's another picture of it that shows how high it is. Look at a tower over the other skyscrapers. But if we wanted to get that to the moon, we would have to do about a, a half a million of those towers, one on top of the other. Because the distance to the moon varies a little bit between about 240,000 to 250,000 uh, miles away. So if we wanted to do a half mile tower, I guess you'd have to do about half a million on the way to the top. So that would be very effective, would it, to get to the moon? Do you think building to the moon would be a good way to get there? It would take forever. Yeah, it would. We. I don't think we'd ever get there. In fact, we. You know, we run out of air once we got to a point. I think building would be almost impossible. You know, luckily God gave us, you know, uh, the human brain, the ability to do something like construct a rocket, and and that way we can get there. But I think of it in the old ways of how they used to worship God. Uh, they used to have something called a tabernacle. A tabernacle was basically a tent where they kept the Ark of the Covenant, where you had the Ten Commandments. You guys are learning the Ten Commandments in Sunday school? You know any of them? Well, only one God. That's the first one and most important. Thank you, Amelia. Very good. Very good. But that's where it would be. And then they start to, to decide in Solomon's time, hundreds of years later, they would build a, a temple, which was the first uh, Jerusalem temple that would get destroyed by the Babylonians. And then they'd even make a bigger temple, uh, which would be the second temple in Jerusalem. And there was a man named King Herod the Great that tried to make this temple even bigger and greater than it was before. And it was, it, it probably in those days was as impressive as uh, the tower in Dubai is today. I mean, it, it, it was, it was huge. And a lot of people were putting focus on the, on the temple, which to me, I don't know if it was really a great idea because, you know, they did a lot of sacrifices and they, they worried about sacrifice, but do you think it was bringing people closer to God? I mean, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it's a question that really doesn't really have an answer. It might, because when you sacrifice, you realize that, you know, we have something called sin. Do you know what sin is? What is sin? Yeah, when you do things that are against what our relationship with God and others, right? So they did, uh, so they thought, you know, the more sacrifices we do, the bigger the temple it would be, you know, the more God would be impressed with it, and I don't think God was all that impressed. I don't think it was really bringing people closer to God any more than building high towers is bringing us closer to the moon. You know, because people weren't doing what the law wanted us to do, which is to love God and love others. So Jesus would then come down. And what would Jesus do? He would teach us some things. What did Jesus teach us? Do anyone know? Anybody have any idea? None. No clue what Jesus came for. What, did he want us to care about each other? Or did he just, eh, you know, whatever. Yeah, he did want us to care about each other. Do you want us to care about God and remind us that we're not in charge and God's in charge? Yeah. Those, those things. And he came and he showed us that. And he didn't even just tell us. You know, he did this by, he healed people. He walked with people. He showed them love. And he, be, he walked with them. And eventually he would show us in the greatest way by even going to the cross for us. Saying, I'll take their sin and I'll die for them. 
you know, and he did what the temple really wasn't doing. I mean, the temple was kind of a big show, and it was, you know, it did remind people that, you know, that they were sinners, but it, it really didn't relieve them of their sin, uh, which only God can take away. And he does that through a, a different type of sacrifice. A sacrifice of showing his love for us by dying for us on the cross. Why don't we say a prayer, okay? Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we know, we know no matter what we do, no matter what we, do we, cannot reach you, we cannot reach you. But because of your love for us, you reach us. Amen. Thank you, ladies, for coming out. Most of you know that I like pop culture, so I thought I could go a little heavy on pop culture this Sunday. And if I can get the first screen, Katie. Does anyone remember that picture? Anybody have a polyester suit? Ah, oh, somebody raised Scott. You, I, why does that not surprise me? That does not surprise me whatsoever. Uh, polyester suit that uh, was, was very uh, popular after this movie came out. This movie came out in December of 1977. And this movie really combined a, a coming of age story that was kind of gritty and, and a little bit violent, and it mixed it up with disco music, which you wouldn't think would work. But for some reason, this movie worked and it became a box office smash uh, in the year 77 and 78. Because it came out in 77, but it was mostly in the theaters in 78. And when I think of this uh, movie, I think that I remember this. Uh, one thing I read about this movie, that they were testing this movie with a test audience. So people were watching people watch a movie. And there was a certain scene in the movie during this test that people started to boo the movie screen. And they found that going back to the place where people were booing, it was a point where there was a close-up on the very famous swimsuit poster of Farrah Fawcett Majors, which seemed almost un-American to boo Farrah Fawcett Majors at that time, except for the fact that she had just quit Charlie's Angels. And people took it personally that she was leaving the show. And they found out that the reason why she left the show is because she hated the hours. I mean, they, she had 18 hour days and they put a strain on her marriage with Lee Majors. And she found that the scripts were pretty light, to put it mildly, and there was basically no character development. And because of that, she left, but everybody kind of thought it was because of the money, and, uh, and they took it personally. But the bigger question wasn't, you know, why did Farrah leave the show? Uh, who, by the way, turned out to be a pretty good actress in shows like The Burning Dead, and then she, uh, you know, had that heroic battle with cancer that was very admirable. Uh, but the bigger question was, is who's going to replace her? They found a gal from South Dakota named Cheryl Ladd, who was actually singing for cartoon characters at the time. Josie and the Pussycat, she was singing for. And they wanted her, but she did not want to replace a phenomenon. So, they convinced her that they would make her character a little different. They'd allow her to make mistakes. They would allow her to be funny, and she said, okay, I'll take the role. And she lit up the screen, just like Farrah did. And the second season of Charlie's Angels was slightly higher in the ratings than the first. Now, they didn't know if it was because of the change in the time slot, but a big part was is because Cheryl Ladd did a very good job of replacing Farrah Fawcett. We see this pattern repeat itself over and over, and we saw it in the 90s as well with a David Crusoe. I know that Donna doesn't like David Crusoe, but <laughs> she didn't like him on CSI. But he started out at NYPD Blue in the 90s, 
And again, a detective show. With a little bit better writing and a few fewer bikinis. The writers at NYPD Blue, you know, at least knew that most detectives don't do their work in swimming attire. And because of that, it was a higher critical success than Charlie's Angels was. But David Crusoe became the breakout star there. And when he, he left in the second season, about four seasons, four shows into it, again, people were upset about it, and they said, well, how are we gonna replace him? Well, Jimmy Smith came in, and they found that he was just a natural for the show. And he gave the show an even bigger boost. And he would stay with the show for uh, about six seasons, and NYPD Blue lasted about 12 seasons. I mean, it was a pretty successful show. But what uh, Jimmy Smith and Cheryl Ladd tell us is very much everybody is replaceable as far as their job is concerned. Now, when it comes to priests, we find in the second lesson that David wrote, or read that not only are the priests replaceable, but the whole priestly system is replaceable. In Judaism, for about 1,500 years, priests were essential for the sacrificial role in Judaism. I mean, the law, of course, was a big thing, but Judaism really started to focus heavily on sacrifices for sin and as offerings of thanksgiving to God. And the priests pretty much took that role. There were the priests that came from the family of Levi, but the high priest really was modeled after Moses' brother Aaron. And they took care of the sacrificial system, and once the temples were built, the first one destroyed by the Babylonians, and the second one destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD, you know, they were really the center of Jewish worship particularly with the sacrifice of atonement, which occurred on the 10th day of the 7th month every year. Now, understanding that the priests were human, which I give uh, Judaism its credit for that, the high priest would first of all sacrifice a young bull or a ram for the sins of the priest. And then he would take two goats, and one goat he would sacrifice for the sins of the people, and the other goat, which was considered the winner of the lottery, I don't know why, but would take on the sins of Israel in a, you know, a symbolic, ceremonious way, and it was led out into the wilderness never to be seen again. Do you know what that goat was called? Yeah, I hear it over, I see Pauline and Shelley saying at the same time, the scapegoat. And that type of worship was very important, and I think because it was both, a, you know, a visual to the people, and in their participation in watching, in a, in a way that was almost liturgical, it was almost a kinesthetic way to understand that they had sins that needed to be atoned for, until, of course, Jesus came to give us reconciliation to God the Father. Today's lesson in Hebrews, the second lesson today, focuses on that shift. And it starts out by letting us know that in the old days, there were a lot of priests. Because a priest's career died upon death. Which makes sense, doesn't it? Your career would end upon death. You know, unless you're a cadaver, your career is pretty much going to end at death if it has not ended already, which hopefully somebody can get a little bit of retirement in that. But it focuses on, focus on that, and it says that's true with all the priests of the temple, but it is not true with Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ, after his death, rose, he resurrected, and he would ascend into the heavens, and he is still alive. Not only at the right hand of the Father, but He's alive through the Holy Spirit to us. We have a living relationship with Him. So He can be a priest forever. And through eternity, He can reconcile us 
to God the Father. He is our eternal intercessor. And we should want that because he's holy, he's blameless. He doesn't have blemish. He's exalted in the heavens. This is the priest that we should want over any type of temple priest. Because unlike any other priest, what he doesn't have to do is continuously make sacrifices. He doesn't have to make sacrifices for himself because he's blameless. And he doesn't have to make sacrifices for the people anymore. Because when he was incarnated into human form, he gave all that up to show us how much God loves us by willingly going to the cross. By willingly say, okay, I'll go. I'll show the people how much I love them by giving them my flesh and my blood for them. And in doing so, taking on our sin, giving us his salvation. And when we put our faith and trust in that, that is where the reconciliation takes place. The Old Testament law gives us the priesthood of the family of Levi. The promise of God gives us the perfect eternal priest and the Son of God, Jesus Christ. Now it's interesting, uh, after reading Hebrews, when you look at, you know, when was Hebrews read? It was probably uh, written, you know, a couple, a couple decades before the destruction of the Jerusalem Temple. The Romans would destroy the Jerusalem Temple in about 70 AD. And when the, te the second temple was destroyed by the Romans, there really wasn't a place to sacrifice. And the priestly system in Judaism died. You know, there is no more priests in Judaism. Their shift went from the temple and the priest to the rabbi and the synagogue. And in the synagogue, you know, they would study the Torah, the Old Testament law, and the Old Testament scriptures, you know, which we share with our Jewish brothers and sisters. And it would focus on prayer and following the law. You know, we have that connection with Judaism. Before the Christians that came out of Judaism, you've got to remember Christianity was a movement within Judaism. We have a new high priest in Jesus Christ who gave everything for us to reconcile with us in a one-time sacrifice so we don't have to continue to slaughter animals as a remembrance of our need for a home in a sense. Now that's a, a big change. Plus, we had Gentile converts, which most of us would have our roots in the Gentile converts. And there are some people who will say, well, how could Jesus be a priest? He's not of the house of Levi. He's of the house of Judah. And that's where we get to our first lesson, where, by the way, you read the name really well in the first lesson. There's the first priest that is mentioned in the scriptures. His name is Melchizedek. He cannot be of the house of Levi because he's a contemporary of Abraham, and Abraham is the great-grandfather of Levi. So Melchizedek cannot be part of that priesthood, the Levite priesthood modeled after Aaron, who came much later than Levi, even. Because he is the first priest mentioned. He is a ally of Abraham. They have just defeated a number of kings in a local battle, and after he defeats those kings, Melchizedek comes with bread and wine, a foretaste of Holy Communion. Abraham gives him one-tenth of his spoils, a foretaste of tithing. And Melchizedek a priest of the Most High God, even though he's not of the family of Abraham, even though he's not of the family of the covenant, blesses Abraham in the name of the Most High God. Not that Melchizedek is superhuman or that he's a son of God, but what he reminds us is there is a priesthood outside of the Old Testament priesthood of Abraham. <coughs> 
And Jesus is a priest, just like he is a king, where it's a kingdom not of this world. Just like he's a priest, not of the priesthood of Levi. He's a savior, our Lord, but most of all, he is God the Son who came to, to us. Give us this one time sacrifice. And then in the Christian church, you know, we have ministers of the word and the sacrament. Sometimes we give them the term priest, sometimes we give them the term pastor, sometimes we give them the term minister. In reality, we're all part of the priesthood of believers. But like the Levi priests, we're imperfect. The only priest that was perfect was Jesus. And with all of us, we're replaceable, both with our lives, with our jobs. But through the love of God that comes to us through Jesus Christ, none of us are replaceable. Not as far as vocation, but as part of who we are as God's children. We are irreplaceable as God's children. Amen.
And Katie, we should probably have a call and response after the dedication of the quilts, hopefully on the second frame. So I'll start. Gracious God, as we place our hands on these quilts, we join giver and receiver, recognizing the unity of all your people in the body of Christ. We celebrate the being the children of God. We give thanks for the variety of gifts that compose these quilts, donations of money, fabric, and thread. The faithful people who cut the squares, design the patterns, sew the tops, iron the fabrics, make the backs and fillers, tie and stitch the bindings. We celebrate generosity. We give thanks for the fellowship of all who work together to make the quilts, the laughter, the shared stories, the joy of crafting something with one's hand and heart for another, and the time to reflect and wonder about the recipient. We celebrate community. We send these quilts as a sign of God's love and blessings for each person who receives one, trusting that their quilt will be a source of comfort and hope and a reminder that each recipient is a beloved child of God. We pray that these quilts will serve a useful purpose in the life of the recipient, that they will bring warmth in the cold. May it be a step in recovering one's life and a message of care from someone they may have never even met. We, we celebrate hope in the midst of life's trials. We ask that you bless the fruits of your labor and the whole mission of St. Luke's, that together we may minister to our neighbors in need. Bless all who give and all who receive, as we are sown together in the unity of your Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now, I was going to say, uh, stick around for a picture after, but I know you won't. <laughs> so I'm going to ask either Kathy or Shelly to take a picture of these ladies as you turn around. Ah, uh, come on. A nice smile. You, do, you worked hard on this. Be proud. I even get the free picture in it. Now, let's give a hand to these ladies. <laughs> That's the priesthood of believers, a new ministry started by the laity. Please join in confessing our faith together through the words of the Apostles. And together we confess. Set free from sin and death and nourished by the word of truth, we join in prayer for all of God's creation. Risen One, we give you thanks for congregations and ministries throughout the world that serves as centers of prayer and action. Empower missionaries, teachers, healers, evangelists, and all who are sent to share your song of joy. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Holy One, we give you thanks for generous land that produces abundant harvests. Strengthen and protect all soils, from rooftop gardens to prairie farmlands, to patio planters to fertile valleys. And bless all who lovingly tend them. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Ruling One, we give you thanks for leaders of nations who work to build up the common good. Strengthen efforts of reconciliation among all nations that peace extends in every direction. We especially pray for these service members, Colton Drew, Kristen Bartelt, Michelle Schraub, Eric Rohr, Sam Vallier, Caleb Gard, Anthony Church, and also these concerns of our world and nation today that we name now in our hearts or around. Here is, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Lord, pour out your 
your spirit upon us that we might see with your eyes those in need and with your compassion help us move to help them, be it physical, spiritual, or financial. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Healing one, we give you thanks for all who labor for the health of others. Comfort and strengthen all who struggle with chronic pain. Send healing and relief to all who are sick. We especially pray for Dee Turner, James Breeden, Casey Negron, Jeff Flood, Elroy Dorn, Rosalind Bannock, Brian Harbison, Dolores Webb, Sally Freelick, and others we name now. Hear us, O God. And mercy is great. Providing one, we give you thanks for all who provide for others. Inspire generosity in your people so that we carry out the work of making disciples of all nations. We pray for these St. Luke members and their families, Andrew and Jamie Shaw, Tina Cromery, Lori Crone, Daniel Grunwald, Eric Bauer, Gail Schultz, Betty Cagle, Terry Osmond, Jessica Bauer, Melanie Long. Lord, in your mercy. Living one, we give you thanks for the saints who have increased our faith. Give us courage to follow and hope until you gather us all around your table of abundance. Hear us, O oh God. Mercy. Confident that you hear us, O oh God, we boldly place our prayers into your hands through Jesus Christ, our truth and life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying to them, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, you proclaim our Lord's death until he comes again. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. The gifts of God for the people of God. The table has been set, and all are welcome. The body of Christ given for you. 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 
body of Christ given for you. The 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 body of Christ given for you. And the blood of Christ shed for you.
Please rise if you're able. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the gift of his body and blood strengthen, keep, and unite us now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. <clears throat> Ever faithful God, you have taken us again into your arms and nourished us as your dear children. Lead us and guide us that we may share our bread in the living life. Lord, 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 May God bless us and keep us. May God's face shine on us and be gracious unto us. May God look on us with favor and grant us peace.